Thanks, everybody. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Our next guests are losers. Well, according to the new documentary series, they are. The new Netflix series, Losers, profiles some of the worst sporting moments in the lives of its subjects. But what it also shows is that sometimes losing is a gateway to greater things. Let's take a look. Mm, that's not a good thing. He's going to get a piece of it. He may have it. She was not expected to actually win the race. It's all about winning, 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 winning. Anybody who goes to a football match expecting to win is an idiot, I think. Oh, oh my dear. He's 100% in his career loser. He muttered to me, if you'll excuse my English, shit, I've lost it. Illusion is a habit, and you get that mindset, then you think you're never going to win a game again. I said, that's it. I'm done with basketball. I've said it to him many times. You're the biggest waste of talent I've ever seen. I had never encountered that kind of darkness before, but I knew I had something to prove. If you're fourth, it's like, what would have, could have, should have? That would probably haunt me. I'm sure it haunts her. He was distraught. He was just saying, I'm never going to curl again. Things happen for a reason, you know? And now, which part of yourself is going to come out? Who are you really? What are you made of? If you're not going to be a good loser, you're not going to be a good winner either. Many days you feel like crying, but winning is not the most important thing in life. Getting knocked out was the best thing that ever happened to me. There have been more downs than ups. But in a way, that makes the ups feel all the better. Everybody, please welcome, put your hands together for Michael Bent, Jack Black, Jack Ryan, and Mickey Gigi. Thank you. Um, I love this show. I have to say, I was telling you this in the green room, uh, I'm not the biggest sports documentary guy. I don't flock to watch uh, docs about sports. And when I turned this on, I think I expected one thing. And I was so happily surprised at what this is, that this is profiling people who played sports, but it's mostly, it's mostly profiles in loss and sort of coming out of that loss, coming out of that and finding some sunlight and a better life afterwards. Um, Congratulations, it's so well done. It's so well done. Thanks. Um, how did this start for you? When did you first come up with the idea? Was there a particular person that you met that you ended up profiling that felt like, okay, this could be a series? Well, I, I've made a couple sports documentaries before. Love I Love those too. No. Oh, no, thank you. <laughs> um, no, but I'm always looking for interesting sports stories that have kind of uh, counterintuitive lessons from them, uh, that come from them. And... Uh, you know, I feel like uh, we, we do have a winner-centric culture, and even though there are many sports documentaries that are being made, nobody looks at the people who, the underdogs that didn't pull it off, that don't have a Hollywood ending. And uh, we always say that we learn more from our failures and our losses than we do from our wins. Um, but that wasn't always reflected in the stories that we were telling in documentaries. So I right. thought Usually there was an opportunity. Like, I failed and I lost, but then I still got the championship medal the following year. That's right. And like, kind of, you saw that narrative play out with Tiger Woods coming back and winning. That's that's kind of the story in sports documentaries. But what if, <laughs> what if it, it never happens? Um, in, in culture, we typically push those people off the stage, but I think that in the stories you find that there were intangible benefits, surprising benefits that, that came over time when, uh, when our subjects really reframed what success and loss really looked like and found out what was more valuable in life beyond just winning championships. The, tangentially, though, I will say the Tiger thing is so fascinating because it's the one underdog story where the underdog came back and won something, and for some reason everybody went, Oh, okay. Like, nobody was like, yeah, he's back. Everyone was like, oh, I don't know how I feel about this one. Yeah, yeah. I suppose. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, the series starts with your story, Michael. And your story, uh, it's, it feels like it's so important to the, to, the, to the whole show because it starts with a certain form of loss. It starts with talking about your childhood and going into this thing that you didn't even really want to be a part of but happened to end up being good at. What... 
made you comfortable opening up and telling the story of um, basically an, uh, being an abused child? Well, after my uh, uh, boxing career ended in 1995, I started writing. And uh, uh, then I started acting. And when I started writing, I always had this mantra, uh, tell the truth like Spike Lee writes movies. I didn't know what that meant, but like, you know, I was aiming for that. And I figured, look, if I get up in a ring and take punches in front of people, I can be honest with like my truth. So there it is. Either you accept it or you don't. The play that you wrote that's talked about uh, in your episode, what was it about your life as I didn't write the play. You didn't no, write no, the play. I directed it. You just directed yeah, it. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Misunderstood. Sorry. No, sorry, right, sorry. Right. Yeah. And what was it like exploring this aspect of your life? Did you always feel that leaving boxing or what boxing taught you, even though you didn't really want to be a part of yeah. it, changed your life and made you who you are now? Do you have any regrets about having been a boxer? Uh, I appreciate the uh, education that boxing gave me. You know, I always say that I'm a high school dropout, and I am, but proudly. Uh, but traveling the world as a member of the USA boxing team educated me, culturally and other ways. And uh, so that's like a, that's my education. But I loved the amateur part of the uh, of boxing because of the camaraderie with your guys, you know, your comrades who travel all the way across the world with you to Russia or to Sweden, those places. The pros are a different animal. Professional boxing is a whole different animal. And although I was in conflict with the amateur boxing. I was really in conflict with pro, pro boxing because, like, you know, I'm not a savage, man. I'm not a piece of meat. And the managers at large identify or see you as a piece of meat. I'm, I'm not that. Right. When you're an amateur, you're still training. You're That's still, right. like, a very, you have a close personal relationship That's with right. people that are bringing That's you right. up. There's yeah. a, a nobility to it. Whereas, you know, if you're a pro and you're on the hustle to make, like, you know, a name for yourself, it's all, you know, you're a piece of, you're a slab of meat, essentially. Mm -hmm. And uh, I never, I was always in conflict with that idea. And it exists, yesterday and today. You know, Jack, your story, uh, it's really beautiful. You kind of find that you realize that you love working with kids and entertaining kids. Uh, when you did realize that, and obviously you're, playing basketball or you're, you know, of a kind in front of these kids all the time. Do you even still think about that period of time where you wanted to be a professional basketball player, where you were concerned about it? No, I have way more fun doing this with the kids. And uh, as most of my family and friends would say to me all the time, is like, if you did make it to the NBA, you would have been thrown out of there also. Really? Oh, yeah. You think, I, you, think that, you would have been miserable in the NBA? I wouldn't have been miserable. I would have, with all that fame and more money, I would have been more crazy. I would have never went home. I, would, I wouldn't have slept two hours a, a night. I would have slept zero. Um, so I definitely, you know, I was, at that time, I couldn't handle any authority, you know. And then I finally found peace when I became a Harlem Wizard. And I knew this is what, this is what I was here for. I practiced for this my whole life. I've always been a class clown, got thrown out of every classroom, you know, can spin a basketball when I was eight years old and was a good basketball player. So I hit the nail right on the head. And, you know, I'm going to be 58 years old, and every single day I'm at schools, you know, I get to hear the laughter of children and see them smile and feed them positive messages. Was there a moment where you felt like you found that peace, or was that something that you noticed within yourself over the course of time while, while, while working as a wizard? It happened, like, overnight. I, I got my self-esteem. Like I said, I knew this is why I'm here. I was not letting this go. I was not screwing up, and I just went back into the gym like when I was a little kid to be, to be a good basketball player, I said, I'm gonna be the best trickster on the team in a year. And in one year, I was, and one of my guys on the team said, you know, you can make a lot of money doing halftime shows. So I put together a tape, and my first halftime show was at the Garden, Madison Square Garden, and it's, it's just been heaven ever since 1997, June 1997. Overnight? Yeah, overnight, I, I, knew, I, I, I knew this is why I was here. And you kind of had a similar experience when you were injured, or in, to a certain degree injured, and you were basically told that you couldn't box anymore. You said that essentially the first feeling that you had was a wave of relief that your boxing career was over, right? My last pro fight? 
Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Got knocked out uh, by Herbie Hyde in 1996. 94, so, sorry, in seven rounds. And, like, you know, so I went into a 96-hour coma and uh, woke up and... Uh, a 96-hour coma, medically induced, right? Just four days, yeah. 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 And the uh, my uh, neurosurgeon, John Sutcliffe, said, uh, you can't fight anymore. And uh, I was I was conflicted because... Boxing was what I thought defined me, right? And uh, as a fighter, you want to get some kind of retribution. But I, I mean, I, I knew that uh, that thing, boxing, wasn't uh, what I was uh, designed to be doing, you know. As an amateur, yeah, but as a professional, no. Even if you are designed, no one's designed to do it that long. I mean, I had, a relative, I had a relatively short career as a pro, but I had a vast amateur career. Yeah. And those, like, when you, you know, compound those numbers, it's wear and turn the body. It's trauma. Because, you, you know, you're sparring as an amateur, and you're getting hit. And you're fighting as an amateur, and you're getting hit. And you compound that, like, you know, by the professional aspect, it's even heightened even more. Now, when you found writing and acting, did you feel as though you found the same kind of piece or a similar piece that Jack is talking about? More. Well, 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 so well, kind of competitive more, then, but, I see. Well, 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 not, well, I'm, gonna, well, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I jumped into your, you know, into your uh, question. But uh, no, I, you know, when I started writing and acting, um, I hadn't experienced any feeling like, uh, like I had when I, um, wrote a piece for Burt Sugar's fight game, and he said, "Mike, that's really good stuff." Whoa, you know. And when I, uh, you know, when I nail a scene in acting class, and my uh, acting teacher, who typically gets in my behind, he says, "There's nothing like it, man." Because, like, you know, acting and writing, it's being creative, whereas boxing, on some level, someone's being destroyed. That's what it is. What was the selection process like for your team, for you and, and your team that put this together? What kind of, were you, did you know what kind of stories you were looking for when you set out? Or was it, let's see what's the most interesting thing in general that comes back? Well, I just want to say, like, just sitting here, it, it's such a privilege to sit with these guys because I admire them so much. Yeah. And, and one thing about, like, getting to know them and hearing their stories is that words like bust and loser have been things that have been labels that have been put on these guys, despite the fact that they have challenged themselves to to find their their place in the world, and they have in an admirable way that like I have two little boys, like I would love for them to find their place in the world in the same way that these guys have done, and I feel like actually having gone through everything that they went through, it's so, it's so much more relatable than than so many of the the champions, you know. So. I was looking for, for stories of people who, who endured difficult moments in admirable ways, in ways that we could look at and say, well, you know, our first impression of them maybe is that they never won the big one, you know, or, or in Michael's case, he did, but he, he was quickly uh, out of the game after that. In Jack's case, of course, not making the pros. Oh, and the, the popular perception maybe is that Jack wakes up every morning and thinks like, oh, well, what if I hadn't, you know, done this or that? But actually, um, you know, having had those experiences go uh, take place over, you know, a little bit, ha have processed those things and, and found their way uh, through in an admirable way, that that undermines this this idea that that all of us should be on winning streaks constantly ourselves in our lives and expect to always get the job, the money, the girl, the fame, and everything else. Uh, for, for people like Michael and, and Jack, who have moments in their life where they don't feel like they found their place yet, know it's okay. That uh, sometimes it takes a little bit longer, and if you don't feel like you're like a, a winner or a success right now, like keep plugging away, and, and other opportunities will present themselves. I think it's so interesting that you, that you mentioned that you have two boys because it is something that we never tell young people mm -hmm. or talk to young people about, that life is going to have lots of forks and you're going to make some is going to be opportunities and some is going to be failures. And so often, I remember in high school, all the kids who love sports who would say, I'm going to be a professional athlete, nobody wanted to tell them they couldn't do it. 
So it would be like, yeah, sure, you're going to be. He's not going to be a professional athlete. And then they would leave high school and have no idea what to do because they thought that they were on some kind of track that they were not necessarily on. And if they had something like this or just people telling them that, like, you're going to lose and then something better is going to come along. You just have to give yourself over to it. It could be wildly beneficial. Have you shown your sons the, the show? Or are they, like, very little? They're little. Okay. There's some pretty tough stuff in the, in the show. Fair. Uh, we, we go there, but, but for sure, I want them to know that, you know, there's this false binary that we, we say where it's like either you're obsessed with winning and have the, like, Mamba mentality of, like, a Kobe Bryant, or you're, like, this wimp who just wants uh, participation trophies and everything. The alternative and the thing that I think our show uh, exemplifies is that, like, knowing that failure is a part of life. It's a fundamental part of life. And uh, accepting that and not being in denial of that and giving voice to it like these guys have is a way of moving beyond it into having some emotional growth that can come from that. And that's something that I, I tell my boys in my own ways, even right. though I'm just not because, the show. Just because you're not the champion or just because you're not rich and famous, like you can still have a very rich, rewarding life. And good things come from those experiences that, that don't work out if you challenge yourself to find the good in it. Now, obviously, uh, the show isn't just comprised of these two these two guys right here. Can you talk about some of the other some of the uh, other subjects in the show? Sure. Yeah, we do a, a wide spectrum, uh, all different sports. There are eight episodes. Uh, we go. We do. A, there's a figure skating episode, uh, a dog mushing episode, uh, uh, an ultra marathoner in the Sahara Desert. Uh, all of them are very, very different. Have different experiences, different sports, and the how kind of the failure or the loss uh, manifests in their lives are very, very different. Uh, and what they've found from that, taken from that experience, the positive, admirable qualities that, that have revealed themselves are all different. But it just goes to show that, yeah, in moments of, of loss or failure, it's not the end of the story. Sometimes it's the beginning of a new and exciting chapter. What did you guys think when you were first asked to tell your story of, of losing? I was like, all right, they're going to do another one. Because <laughs> they did one on me 2007 that just made it to YouTube. But I really wanted to do it. Um, the guys that I spoke to uh, in the beginning, Brendan and uh, who was the other guys? Rick. Brendan and Rick, uh, they were really nice, and uh, I met with them, and they were really cool, and they were really interested in my story. And I said, "Sure, let's do it." Jack, do you still play over on West Fourth all the yeah. time? Yeah. Really, you're still. fifty. How old are you? I'll be fifty-eight in July. You're yeah. fifty-eight, and I you're still all. on West Fourth playing street ball with people. With, yes, with I do. Yeah, all the time. Is there anybody else there over 45? Oh, yeah, yeah, there's a few, there's a few oh, of the really? old timers. Actually, years ago, one of the guys came up to me and he said, you know, we're all going to get the logo of West 4th Street on our bodies somewhere. Oh, wow. So they said, are you interested? So I said, sure, I'll get it. So there I am. there's the West 4th Street logo. That's my, uh, that's my backyard. That's my home away from home. You How know? long have you been playing there? Uh, 35 years. Mm. 35 and I have friends from third, still there. Dirty Shermice, Leo, Worthy, um, they're still, my, they're, sh me and Sherm call each other my brother from another mother. So, you know, like I said, that's my backyard. I'm going there right after this. I'm not going to play, but I'm going to see the guys right after this. You're just going to hang out and watch them? Watch them I'm just going to go watch them argue. Yeah, that's all they do is argue. <laughs> you know, I, I'll just stand on the court and watch. And Michael, uh, what about you? What were your first thoughts when, when, when they approached you to tell your story? I said, absolutely not. Not really? doing it. No, of course not. Oh. No. <laughs> no, Mickey, you know, it's, uh, I was introduced to Mickey by, uh, by Bryn Butler, a writer from Montreal. And me and Mickey just connected organically. Uh, we said, you know what? Yes, yeah, let's, let's do it. And we shot uh, three days in L.A., Two in New York, my old neighborhood in Queens, Cambridge Heights, uh, Flushing Meadow Park, where I first started boxing. And uh, I mean, him and the crew crafted uh, a beautiful piece of work. And I have to say, like, uh, another thing that was, was a reason why we, we made uh, Jack and Michael stories is that when, when we spoke to one another for the first time, there was this radical honesty. With, with which they talked about their experience, uh, so even the dark moments that they had to get through. Um, I, and I give them credit, and I think that that's the reason why their stories have connected with an audience around the world. They've both gotten tons of messages from people who were really, really inspired by that candor 
by them talking about what it really felt like to be in, in difficult moments where they didn't know the path forward. And those things were evident to me when I, when I first spoke with them. And I'm just, I'm just grateful for, for them, for, for their honesty in talking, not just about you know, the end result, which was so successful and, and has been things that have been, been great for them, but, but also like the more difficult moments because I think all of us can relate to moments in time when we just don't know what to do next. You know, where we're a little bit lost, where we're recovering from some sort of failure, whether it's losing a job, a relationship explodes, or, or whatever else. And uh, it's been amazing to see that people who aren't professional athletes, or like yourself, aren't necessarily people that love sports documentaries, really be able to connect with these stories in a, in a really deep way. Michael, what was that period of time like after you decided... Well, you were told that you couldn't box anymore before you found writing and acting. I mean, obviously, you were kind of a reluctant champ mm -hmm. already in the sense that you weren't sure how much you loved the sport of boxing yeah. or being in it. But once you had to leave behind this period of your life yeah. that was, you know, what, 10, 15 years where yeah. all you were doing was boxing? 18 years, actually. 18 years. Yeah. What was that like to suddenly not have boxing in your life it's terrifying. at all? You know, I had a little bit of money. You know, not, I didn't have Mike Tyson money, but I had, like, you know, I had okay money but it was terrifying because uh i didn't know how long the money would last and whether or not uh i would last and i was having like and i was it was post the uh the the trauma that i had experienced uh, and i was you know psychologically not unbalanced but i was questioning myself because uh, i was in this dark dark place um and i remember like you know i bought a car and Whew, man, uh, I would drive to New York to train some kid uh, in a boxing gym, and I hated it. And I would speed back. I bought a, uh, I bought a home in the Poconos, and I, and I would speed back, and I would floor this car, like an 850 BMW, right? I would floor it and close my eyes and just go. go. I, no, no, I was trying to hurt myself. Yeah. Worse than that. You know, this, so, so that's the uh, level of... Uh, not even level, like uh, the depth of, of, uh, of pain I was in, but I couldn't express it to myself. I couldn't embrace it to myself. I couldn't, like, you know, hold it and say, my man, it's, just, it's okay. I, I couldn't do that. Well, I imagine you had never really been surrounded by people who knew how to talk about or deal with anything That's right. like that, right? You know what's, wow. That's really important because about a half hour ago, 45 minutes ago, me and Mickey and Mr. Chavez, where you at, Mike? Chavez, well, he's about his son. There we go, right there. We were sitting around at, at a table, not too far from here, at a Japanese restaurant, and we were like sharing, right? And we were sharing stuff that men don't typically share, like deep, honest, raw stuff. And uh, I shared a, a tear or three, or four, or five, or 12, you know? And, you know, they were all, they were embracing of that. And men don't do that. You know, and, and uh, Mickey said that as men, we have to find safe places to express our, our, um, our pains and our vulnerable points, you know, and that was like 45 minutes ago. We don't do the it. only conversations I like to have. Sorry? <laughs> those are the only conversations well, I like to well, have. Well, in addition to. Yeah. But like, you know, those kind of conversations are important mm -hmm. because we don't do those things, man. You know, we're ashamed of it. It's like, it's not manly. Yes, it is manly. I cry. Tell me I'm not a man. I'm like, you know, what's a man anyway? I, I don't know. I, I'm still trying to find out what the hell a man is. You know, but, uh, so yeah. Did I answer your question? Of course. Yeah, that answers my okay. question. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, it's hard when you, when, when you're feeling, when you're in a, a place and you're broken and you have a lot mm -hmm. of feelings and no one has ever taught you. And you're a hypersensitive. Yeah. And f for those of you who don't know, most boxers who will get punched in the face for free, they're hypersensitive. Mike Tyson is hypersensitive, which is why he's such a, you know, he's so raw. You know, Muhammad Ali was hypersensitive. And nobody ever talks to them or works no, with them not. as if they're hypersensitive. Because they're savages, man. Yeah. You know, like, you know, you're, you're, you're well, what, not savages, but like, you're warriors, you're gladiators. And no one thinks of a gladiator a gladiator as being like you know, this sensitive human being who needs counseling or just like a hug, you know? Um, I think we have a question coming in from Twitter. It's, uh, did any of the athletes you profiled think twice about participating in the series once they heard 
the title? Did you consider other titles? Yeah, the, the title uh, came together af as we were we were putting the shows together. So when we initially reached out to the guys, it we, the show didn't have a title. We were still kind of kicking things around. And like I mentioned earlier, um, in, in talking with the guys and doing the interviews, there were these words like choke artist or, or loser that kept uh, coming up organically over and over. These were labels that these these world-class athletes have had to deal with and, and have had to contend with um, or bust or whatever. So uh, I wanted to make sure that, that the shows, uh, when, we, um, when they came out, they, they were very dignified portraits that obviously had very, very good lessons in them. And I thought, you know, putting the label loser on was, was a commentary about how all of these guys, if, if I hadn't come to them, um, you know, maybe these stories would not have been told. These are not the typical kind of mm -hmm. stories that our uh, culture values. And I think we're whiffing on a lot by not telling these stories, because there's a lot of wisdom and a lot of things that all of us can take away from these stories if they're told with sensi sensitivity and with dignity. And even in narrative, uh, in fiction, we oftentimes, when we tell the story of the quote-unquote loser, that's the loser that is trying desperately to cling to the thing that they had had before. I mean, the first thing that comes to mind mm. is like the wrestler with yeah. Mickey Rourke, which is that like he's desperately still trying to be the wrestler. We're not showing the guy who was one thing before, didn't work out, and has found a new life and built something even potentially even better for himself, or at least spiritually. Yeah. I think we have a couple questions uh, from the audience. Who's a question right here? Hi. Um, I wanted to have a question for Mickey. I just wanted to ask, did you ever think about telling, or would you ever in the future tell the story with like a different type of people, like maybe like a failed actor or failed politician at, or did you feel like you really achieved what you were trying to do with this version with the sports version uh, th th thanks for asking um i i certainly feel like because there's a universal um thing that can be that can be uh you know universal wisdom that can be gleaned from these sports stories i certainly feel like these stories exist in other worlds politics business you name it so i would love to explore that uh one more Hi, my question's also for Mickey. I was wondering what your most loved aspect of documentary filmmaking is, and also maybe what's the most challenging aspect of documentary filmmaking? Well, the, the thing that I love is, is uh, you know, obviously getting to meet these extraordinary human beings and uh, accepting the pressure and responsibility that, co that comes from wanting to tell their stories and to, to reciprocate how the generosity that I feel like they showed me. I mean, for them to, to tell me about moments when even they were having feelings of being suicidal, uh, that's a huge responsibility for our team to present in a dignified way. So um, you have to just like accept that uh, challenge um, as part of it. And, and it's, you know, it, it's, it's tough. The, the schedule is unrelenting. We were 12 weeks on the road uh, shooting uh, the episodes. We were in the Sahara Desert. We were in uh, Alaska, so just physically, it's it's rough uh, doing the animation, which I felt, you know, was in service of telling emotional parts of the story. That was all drawn by hand. I mean, you know, it's 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 difficult. But Who all drew it? Uh, I drew most of it. You drew most of it. Yeah, wow. I, yeah, and I had a I had a team to to help me, uh, but it was 50 minutes of animation on top of everything else in in the year that we made the show. So uh, all all in service of of. Uh, Hopefully, telling stories that that connect with an audience, you know, so it's it's all worth it in the end. That's incredible, uh, guys! I love the series. Um, congratulations on it. Uh, it's on Netflix right now. People can check it out. Uh, and everybody, give them a huge round of applause for being here. Thank and you Jack, for having us. Why don't you, Jack? Why don't you spin us out here? Yeah. <laughs>